Hey, I'm Rob Witcher from Destination Certification, and I'm here to help you pass the CCSP exam. Today, we'll be covering some of the major topics related to cloud infrastructure components in Domain 3. The aim is to help you understand how they interrelate. This is the first of seven videos for Domain 3. I've included links to the other mind map videos in the description below. These mind maps are a small part of our complete CCSP masterclass. There are a ton of components that need to work seamlessly together to deliver cloud services. These components form the backbone of cloud computing and enable all the various as a services that we use infrastructure, platforms, software, databases, functions, containers, blockchain, machine learning as a service, and the list goes on and on. So we're going to talk through the major components required to deliver these services. At a high level, the major groupings of components are compute, network, and storage. So I'll walk through compute, network, and storage and talk about the components used within each. We'll start with compute. Compute is the, essentially the ability to run code. As I mentioned as part of the resource pooling characteristics in the very first mind map, link in the description, you don't typically have direct access to a physical server and physical CPU in the cloud. So how do you access compute? How do you run your code and your applications? The answer is you have access to various types of virtualized compute, such as virtual machines, containers, and serverless. Let's start with virtual machines. A virtual machine is an operating system and some applications running on top of a layer of abstraction instead of running directly on the physical hardware. This is a good example of where a picture is probably worth a thousand words. As you can see in this diagram here at the bottom, we have the compute node. This is essentially the physical server comprising a CPU, a bunch of RAM, a network interface card, etc. The physical hardware. In a traditional computer, the operating system would be running directly on top of the hardware. But in a virtual machine, we have a layer of abstraction between the hardware and the operating system. What is providing this layer of abstraction? The hypervisor. The hypervisor is a piece of software. I like to think of the job of the hypervisor as to be a giant liar. Here's why. An operating system expects to have total and complete control of the underlying hardware. Because a key job of an operating system is to control all the underlying hardware in a coordinated fashion. If you wanted to run two or more operating systems simultaneously on the same underlying hardware, it would never work because each operating system would be trying to have total and complete control and they would therefore conflict with each other. With virtualization, we do this all the time by creating a layer of abstraction between the hardware and the operating system. The layer of abstraction is the hypervisor, the giant liar. The hypervisor is simulating the underlying hardware to each operating system. So each operating system thinks it's controlling the underlying hardware, but what it's actually controlling is virtual hardware that the hypervisor is emulating. This setup therefore allows us to run multiple operating systems and their applications simultaneously on one physical server or compute node. As you can see in the diagram here, we have three virtual machines. Watch out on the exam. Virtual machines might also be referred to as instances or guests. Uh, and one other thing to watch out for on the exam. A hypervisor might be referred to as a virtual machine monitor or VM monitor. Okay, now let's talk about containers. Containers are highly portable code execution environments that run within or on top of an operating system, sharing and leveraging the resources of that operating system. So the basic idea here is that you can package your code inside a container, much like an intermodal shipping container. The cool thing about a shipping container is once you've stuffed, and by the way, like I mean a real physical shipping container. What's really cool about real physical shipping containers is once you've stuffed whatever you want to ship inside, you can now move that container around the world via a ship, a truck, a train, whatever you want, without ever having to repack the container. It makes the containers highly portable. The same idea applies with a container that you put your code in. You stuff your code in the container, and then you can run that container on your Mac laptop, on your on-premise Linux server, the Windows Azure cloud, the Google cloud. Containers make your code highly portable. So containers encapsulate an application and its dependencies, such as libraries, configurations, other binaries, into a single lightweight unit. This approach ensures that the application runs consistently across different computing environments, 
from the development and testing and production perspective. So containers make your code highly portable. Just like with virtual machines, there is a layer of abstraction that a container runs on top of. It's called the container engine. I'll talk about the container engines in a bit later in this mind map. A major difference between containers and virtual machines is where this layer of abstraction is located. With virtual machines, the abstraction is between the hardware and the operating system. With containers, the abstraction is between the operating system and the container. As you can see here, we can run multiple containers on top of the container engine. A big benefit of this is efficiency and portability. From a portability perspective, the container engine abstracts away the specifics of the underlying operating system. This allows exactly the same container to run on top of Windows, server, Mac laptop, or a Linux server. The specific operating system doesn't matter. And this is what makes containers highly portable. The final type of virtualized compute we're going to talk about here is serverless. Serverless encompasses a whole bunch of services that allow you to run applications in the cloud without having to manage any infrastructure. A subset of serverless is called functions as a service. Before we talk about functions as a service, though, I think it's helpful to understand a fundamental concept about functions as a service. We can separate an application into a bunch of interconnected functions. Take a look at this diagram here. A more historical way of developing an application is to create a monolithic application. This is where all the functions of the application, all the colored shapes here, are packaged together into a large executable. A disadvantage of this approach is that if the demands, the usage of the application grows, it can be difficult to scale the performance of the application or, or the underlying system that's running on top of. And often only certain functions or groups of functions need to be scaled. So that leads us to the next approach, microservices. The idea here with microservices is you take the same application, the same functionality, but you break the application down into groups, groupings of functionality called microservices. One of the advantages of doing this is that it's now easier to scale the application as you can focus on scaling whichever microservices you need to. Taking this decomposition a step further, we arrive at functions as a service. Again, the same application providing the same functionality, but we've now broken the application down into individual functions that talk to each other via API calls. This is a fundamental aspect of functions as a service. Simple functions are written and stored in the cloud, and these functions are called as much or as little as desired. As a developer, you basically don't have to think about the infrastructure at all. If you wanted to call a function a million times a second or th every three weeks, it is exactly the same function. And a really cool benefit of this is that if you never call the function, you never pay anything. Zero usage equals zero costs. The final piece we'll discuss here related to compute is immutable workloads. The core idea of immutable workloads is the name immutable, which means unchanging over time or unable to be changed. You create workloads, virtual machines, containers, microservices, etc., where the underlying environment, configuration, and application code cannot be changed once deployed. Why? To make them more secure and reliable. Since the environment cannot, does not change, it's easier to reproduce and debug issues as each instant behaves exactly the same way. Immutable workloads reduce the chances of configuration drift, where the environment becomes inconsistent due to ad hoc changes. This leads to a more predictable and reliable environment. And with no modifications allowed after deployment, immutable workloads minimize the risk of unauthorized changes or configurations that would introduce vulnerabilities. So it's a much more secure way of deploying your workloads. Super cool idea. All right, onwards. The next major group we'll talk about now, network components. There's a lot of different network traffic flying around within the cloud, and it's extremely important for cloud providers to separate traffic based on function and purpose. This segregation enhances security, performance, and manageability. You absolutely do not want some random user out on the internet to be able to access the super secure network that a cloud provider uses to manage their cloud infrastructure. So let's talk about the three, possibly two, different isolated networks in the cloud. The service network, often called the front end or application network, handles user and application traffic. This is where clients interact with services such as web servers, application servers, and other business applications. Put simply, the service network is what 
customers have access to. The storage network is dedicated to handling data traffic between servers and storage systems, such as SANS storage area networks or NAS's network attached storage. The reason for having a dedicated isolated storage network is that it separates storage traffic from general application traffic, reducing latency and avoiding bottlenecks that could impact data access speeds. And now the really critical network from a security perspective, the management network, which the cloud provider or the cloud service provider uses to manage all of the IT infrastructure, including administrative access to servers, physical network devices, hypervisors, firmware updates, configuration and monitoring of systems, etc. The management network must always, always be a dedicated, isolated network with the utmost security. And now let me explain what I meant earlier about how you might have two or three different isolated networks in the cloud. In a non-converged network model, you will have three dedicated isolated networks. The three I just described, service, storage, and management. However, in a converged network model, you will merge two of these networks together, the service and storage networks. You would never ever want to converge your management network. As I said, and it bears repeating, the management network must always be a dedicated isolated network. Here's a diagram to help you visualize this. Again, the management network will always be isolated. In a non-converged network, the service network, shown as the LAN network, and the storage network, shown as the SAN network here, are separate networks. While in a converged model, the service and storage networks are merged into a single converged network. Next up, let's talk about how we can use virtualization to logically segment our networks. And with the SDN, the software defined network, achieve some really cool security benefits. We're going to start with VLANs, virtual local area networks. These allow you to logically segment a network. Put another way, you can segment a network through software instead of having to physically segment a network by buying and configuring new network hardware, routers, switches, etc. A VLAN can comprise a subset of the ports on a single switch or a subset of ports on multiple switches, thus allowing systems to be logically separated, segmented into groups. Network segmentation has a lot of security benefits and VLANs can be a good way of cost effectively achieving segmentation efficiently and economically. Software defined networks are a massive leap forward in virtualization beyond just simple VLANs. A software defined network allows you to create multiple completely virtualized software controlled networks on top of a single physical network. SDNs provide far greater flexibility for reconfiguring a network, or at least your virtual network, rapidly by centralizing all the control of the virtualized network. SDNs are a crucial part of what makes the cloud work. Fundamentally, the SDN provides a layer of abstraction for network topology, network flow, and network protocols. It allows you to build virtual networks on top of your physical network. And the next, the final major group we'll talk about here, storage components except I'm not going to talk about all the storage components again, as I dedicated a whole mind map to them in domain two, the cloud data storage mind map, where I discuss volume storage, object storage, raw disk, ephemeral, and all that fun stuff. Link in the vid description for that video. So that brings us to the last piece I'm going to explain related to all these compute network and storage components, infrastructure as code. Infrastructure as code is a very cool idea. Fundamentally, everything in the cloud is essentially controlled by API calls, application programming interfaces. You can deploy new virtual firewalls and completely configure the firewall based on API calls. You can instantiate a new virtual machine or a new container with whatever software you want running on top of it via an API call. You can attach some storage to your newly created virtual machine by again, API calls. Like I said, you can create and control essentially everything via APIs. And now here is where infrastructure as a code comes in. You can create script code, what will deploy your infrastructure. Infrastructure as a code allows infrastructure to be defined and deployed with version control in the same way you develop actual software applications. And this allows you to very effectively turn the deployment and management of your cloud infrastructure into essentially a software development project. Why? because this enables a huge amount of automation of your infrastructure. 
management and reduces human error, speeds up processes and enhances consistency across environments. Just like application code, infrastructure code can be stored in version control systems like Git, enabling rollbacks, code reviews, and tracking of changes over time. It allows for consistent configuration of environments across the development, testing, and production, ensuring that infrastructure behaves the same way regardless of the environment. Environments can be recreated on demand from the code, which is particularly useful for scaling applications or disaster recovery. The list goes on. And combine infrastructure as code with immutable workloads that we discussed earlier? Very super cool idea. What underpins all of this is the pervasive use of virtualization. Just about everywhere, pretty much, not all, but most of the compute, network, and storage components are virtualized. Virtualization is a foundational technology in the cloud that plays a critical role in enabling the scalability, flexibility, and efficiency of cloud services. So let's dig into virtualization. Virtualization is a technology that creates virtual versions of physical hardware, such as servers, storage devices, or networks. It allows emulation. Abstraction is a broader concept that hides the underlying complexity of a system, exposing only the necessary details for the user or other systems. Abstraction simplifies how resources are managed and accessed by masking low-level operations and presenting a simplified interface or model. So virtualization enables abstraction. Virtualization creates virtual instances of hardware resources, which allows cloud providers to abstract the physical details from end users. Hypervisors, as I also known as I mentioned earlier as virtual machine monitors, are software or firmware that enable virtualization by allowing multiple virtual machines to run concurrently on a single physical host, as we talked about earlier. There are two types of hypervisors that you need to know about. Type one hardware or bare metal hypervisors run directly on the host's hardware without relying on an underlying operating system. Type 1 hypervisors have direct access to the physical hardware, making them highly efficient. Type 2 operating system hypervisors run on top of an existing operating system, like any other software application. This setup makes them less efficient and less secure than Type 1 hypervisors. And Type 2 hypervisors have to go through the OS to access hardware. And a vulnerability in the host OS will impact the security of the hypervisor and any VMs running on top of it. Type 2 hypervisors are easier to install and manage, and they're useful for testing, development, demos, and that sort of thing. Type 1 hypervisors are much better for running systems in production securely and efficiently. Here's a helpful diagram that depicts the difference between Type 1 and Type 2 hypervisors. Another key piece of virtualization software, containerization engines. Containerization engines are software platforms that allow applications to be packed, deployed, and run in isolated environments called containers, as we talked about earlier. So simply put, containerization engines are what containers run on top of. And that brings us to the last but absolutely not least item in this mind map, the management plane. The management plane is what enables the management of the cloud. The management plane is the set of tools, interfaces, and services used to control, manage, and configure resources in the cloud. The management plane provides the interfaces and tools through which administrators manage the cloud infrastructure, services, and applications. The, the security of the management plane is therefore of paramount importance. If the management plane was taken over by an attacker, they could basically do whatever they wanted in the cloud. So lock your management plane down. Very important. The management plane is super important. So we're going to dedicate the whole next video to talking about the management plane. And there you go, that is an overview of cloud infrastructure components in Domain 3, covering the most critical concepts you need to know for the exam.